Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversation. What does South Asia mean as a political construct? How does the arrival of China on the scene complicate the traditional India-centric geopolitical picture or image of South Asia? Are we looking at the end of India's primacy in South Asia? Or is it the beginning of the end of SARC as we know it? To answer these very critical questions and to discuss several more issues I have with me in the studio, Dr. C. Raja Mohan. Dr. C. Raja Mohan is the director of the Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore, and the consulting editor on foreign affairs for the Indian Express. Dr. C. Raja Mohan actually needs no introduction. He is one of India's foremost strategic thinkers whose views are taken very seriously by successive governments in India and strategic communities in India and around the world. Welcome to the National Security Conversation, Thank Dr. Raja Mohan. Thank you for having me. Uh, Dr. Mohan, can we begin by how you understand South Asia as a political construct? Do you understand this as a strategic unit? Do you understand this as a geographical unit or a cultural unit? Uh, does it even exist as a political unit today? No, I think in, in a historical sense, uh, it was a very important region. I mean, I think uh, if you go back to pre-independence, uh, the subcontinent, as it was widely known, uh, was, a, was a real live entity though it was under the colonial rule, uh, the subcontinent's contributions, that is undivided India's contributions to the world. Uh, we've been recently discussing the uh, end of the Second wo First World War in 1918. Right. Uh, more than a million Indian, that is undivided India soldiers participated in it. And in the Second World War, two million uh, Indian soldiers participated in it. So, and then if you think of the Indian Ocean today, in that the undivided India uh, was the foundation on which the British operated in the Indian Ocean. Uh, that means it was not just India was uh, supplying the troops, India was the uh, what some scholars have called the India centre. Right. The right. India centre uh, for the British uh, Empire was the centre on which uh, the security order was founded. The India centre was the basis on which the economic globalization of the 19th and the early 20th centuries took place because it was the cities, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, places from where the Indian businesses uh, operated across. Uh, it was the Chettiars who, you know, cultivated rice and rubber in Malaya, uh, the Gujarati traders operating under the rubric of the empire with some agency of their own. Uh, exported Indian capital, Indian labor moved uh, across the, the, the oceans from Fiji to Suriname. So, South Asia, that time there was no term as South Asia, it was called the Indian subcontinent or just simply India or Hindustan uh, as it was differently called. I mean that, that was a, a very important, very central aspect of uh, 20th century politics. Uh, what has changed it, I mean, uh, was, the, was the breakup, the partition of the subcontinent right. and the inward orientation or the economic inward orientation of all the countries in the region which fundamentally altered, changed, or I would say reduced the salience, the weight of the subcontinent in global affairs. But even after independence, the Raj legacy of Indian centricism in many ways continued in South Asia, right? It did continue, but the problem was, uh, it was a, a political uh, primacy that India sought uh, to maintain that slowly began to disappear fairly quickly. For example, if you recall the partition of the subcontinent, uh, uh, the Pakistan chose to ally with the Western powers. Right. Nehru withdrew India from the historic role that it played, that was of a security provider uh, in the under the empire. So, therefore, actually, what you had was uh, the partition of India. Meant that time it was Pakistan and East Pakistan, a fairly large entity, was aligned with the Americans. India was non-aligned. By the 80s, you had the Russians entered uh, Afghanistan and it produced its own complications. Tibet, uh, some would think, is part of greater subcontinent uh, that is culturally or otherwise came under the Chinese control mm -hmm. in 1949. So, it began to shrink. I mean, that the primacy was a claim that was increasingly applied to a very small set of countries because Pakistan was not going to listen to India. Right. You had the three Himalayan states, at that time Sikkim was a, had a uh, strange, uh, you know, international position. So, you had Bhutan, Sikkim, and Nepal, where Indian influence was dominant, and in South Sri Lanka, uh, but Pakistan and East Pakistan, and they were a different entity. Afghanistan uh, uh, was really largely cut off because of uh, the partition broke the links between 
physical links between India and, uh, and Afghanistan. So it was a vanishing commodity. Indian primacy was a vanishing commodity right from 47 because you had the, the, the partition, the political partition and the conflict that it produced uh, seriously undermined South Asia. Second, that would have not necessarily undermined uh, India's primacy if India had not chosen a self-reliant power. That is, un undivided India was a globalizing entity because it was connected to the global trade, as I said, export of capital, export of labor, the Indian were, Indians were everywhere. But once India chose, look, we're going to be self-reliant, we're not interested in exports, we're going to substitute uh, ex imports. So once India adopted, I'm not saying at this point that's our legacy, it's, it's our history, there's no point in saying it was right or wrong. But the fact is of choosing an inward economic orientation meant India's natural linkages that existed with the Gulf, with the Southeast Asia, with across the Indian Ocean began to dissipate because uh, India was not interested, as simple as that. So, coupled partition, inward orientation of the military strategic energy and inward economic orientation uh, fundamentally helped push South Asia increasingly to the margins of international affairs. And, and yet, as, as a geographical entity, as a, as a cultural, religious, civilizational entity, South Asia comes into being uh, in the 50s or in the 60s. Uh, how, how does that come into being? Who, who's, whose idea was this South Asia? Because it was, as you said, it was subcontinent, Indian subcontinent. It became a different entity later on. No, I, I think it almost till the 70s, I mean, the term was not used. I mean, uh, South Asia, I think I would say in the mid-70s, probably, uh, the Americans were the first to use it. What's the logic behind? Yeah, but I think look, the I think we that was a time when everybody imputed, uh, you know, sinister motives to whatever the Americans did. I mean, Americans were just doing it for convenience sake. Right. Now, if you look at uh, the American State Department's organization, it was called the Near East Division. Uh, there was a Far East, which right. meant beyond uh, subcontinent. You had the Southeast Asia, East Asia, and the Near East was Middle Eastern and uh, the subcontinent. So the South Asia as a, as a name began to gain ground because South Asia itself was getting cut off. So on its own volition, not because somebody tried to cut you off. That was a choice we made. Uh, so uh, that was a convenience sake. I mean, I think later the Americans tried to connect it with Central Asia, all kinds of things happened. But it doesn't matter. But the fact is, the problem was not somebody else designating us as South Asia. It was the loss of regionalist sentiment within India. Right. That India was not interested in the region. Although it had political primacy, it was not interested in economic integration. Uh, it was not interested in uniting the market because in any case, we were not believers in the market. Uh, and once you turned inward, your linkages began to dissipate. I mean, anybody who's been to India-Nepal border, uh, why is it the infrastructure rotting for so long? Because once you thought of your neighbors as foreign countries, the Raj was a united entity. Right? The Raj called, you know, well, the multiple sovereignties there. The Raj saw this as an integrated space controlled from Calcutta till 19, beginning of the 20th century, then Delhi was built, but it had no problems of dealing with it. But moment we said, we're a sovereign, self-reliant, socialist nation, uh, that began to shrink of how you thought about the region. Because in fact, the word regionalism was taboo in the Indian foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, even when the SARC was initially formed in the mid 80s, it was seen as with great suspicion. We were not interested in regionalism or regional integration till you changed your economic direction. So I think the choices India made uh, shrunk the region and it's only when we opened up that we began to think of regional integration, South Asia, SARC. But meanwhile, for the smaller countries, uh, choked by the embrace of India, if you will, they wanted to define themselves because as their sovereignties came into existence, they wanted to define themselves in opposition to India. I mean, large sections of the elite uh, in Nepal, in all our neighbors, uh, wanted to define themselves as something different because they were gaining their sovereignty and they felt that they must distinguish themselves from India. So, so while everyone paid lip sympathy or lip service to, to South Asia, the fault lines, internal fault lines, the absence of economic uh, integration uh, created the tendencies to break up the region. Dr. Ajahn, look at it this way. Uh, the South Asian countries, be it um, Nepal, uh, be it Sri Lanka, be it Bangladesh, there was a time when they did look up to New Delhi for yeah, some that's sort what of... I said, only the three countries, only the three small countries, and out of which one is no longer a country. Uh, so you had the smaller Himalayan kingdoms at the time, 
uh, there was a special relationship that the British left for us. Nehru continued with them, with Nepal, right. the treaties, so he signed fresh treaties with all uh, three of them. Uh, then Sikkim got integrated into India, but Bhutan remained strongly friendly. But in Nepal, the, the political class in Nepal got increasingly divided. Because if you go back to 60, and you talked about the looking up to India, uh, Nepal was neutral in the India-China conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, there's from the 59, 60 onwards, there was a strong section of the Nepali elite which said, look, we can play balancing politics between uh, India and China. So the, it was an illusory claim of, you know, viceroys being appointed as ambassadors and the sense that all you had to was to give a diktat and your smaller neighbors would, would accept it. But India was still the dominant power in the region. China was not playing a major role. So uh, ipso facto, there was a feeling that, hey, here is the dominant power. So I remember um, the then national security advisor in the mid 2000s telling the Sri Lankans that you can buy weapons. Um, you, you can't buy weapons from other countries. You can buy it from us, but we will give you defensive weapons to that extent. So why do you think they dislike you then? Clearly. Exactly. So, so I think that's, that's actually, you hit on the nail on the head. We were politically trying to set the terms mm -hmm. while economically you squandered your natural advantages of being in the center of geography, of choosing a, an, an import substitution strategy, of treating your neighbors as sovereign separate countries rather than part of a community. Uh, so once you said, look, there was no difference anymore between Bhutan and the United States, right? If they said they're sovereign entities, uh, then it's a question of you're not interested in trading with anyone, though you had open borders with Nepal and with uh, with Bhutan. And the kind of problems that came with the, with the Nepalese, for example, Nepalese had to import everything from India. So in that sense, you had a leverage. But we didn't help them get over it and say that, look, we want to grow through openness and we want you to be part of it. That's a song we've adopted only in the 2000s. Till then, the question of, you know, customs differentials, the whole set of problems. So they resented the dependence on you mm -hmm. uh, and they constantly sought to seek uh, balancing that. Uh, initially, we were very suspicious of the West, uh, of West was trying to play our neighbors against us. Uh, but they, for them, it was a very temporary thing. I mean, that, as, you, as you made it clear, that time China was not a player, but politically, China began to act. China built roads in Nepal in the 60s. Uh, it's reached out to Sri Lanka when you go back to uh, Sri Lanka China Rubber Pact, uh, mm -hmm. Ceylon uh, China Rubber Pact, it goes back to the 50s and in the early 60s they signed a maritime agreement. But, but China was still not as proactive as it is. No, it was. I mean, that, what, did, what, what did Chavan Lai do? One, he told the Pakistanis, look, you're part of the Western Alliance. I have no problem with that. As long as you're not against me, uh, probably you might be against India, maybe we'll have a common cause. So Chavan Lai didn't ever oppose US-China, US-Pakistan pact. And if it, the Chinese never opposed US relationship with Pakistan. Because for them, they separated, they carved out Pakistan as a special relationship. After all, the Kashmir agreement between China and Pakistan was 63. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have the economic clout, but they were already becoming a political player by helping them to telling them Look, if you have problems with India, we're always there. So Nepal played that card. Uh, Sri Lanka played that card a lot. I'm trying to understand the strategic thinking in India. Um, yes, India India has had a certain amount of primacy in the region. China was rising economically, not as competent as it is today. It was not challenging India the, the way it is doing today. So India had the opportunity to build um, a certain certain region in its shape and in, in the way it sort of willed. Why did India not do that? What was the kind of strategic thinking that was uh, um, underpinning the Indian strategy for the region um, during all these decades? Look, I think uh, you know, the three levels at which the, the problem is. I, mean, I think uh, one is on the 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 India Nehru understood the importance of the neighborhood. Uh, after all, he signed those three treaties with the with the three states in the Himalayas, mm -hmm. who were threatened by Chinese entry. Into, actually, they were afraid of China because these were Himalayan kingdoms, worried about what China might do to, to them. But then Chavan Lai neutralized that by saying, look, we have no problem with you. Uh, second level, I think, is that uh, the, the focus shifted increasingly to the global stage for India, I mean, of non-aligned movement, uh, the G77, I think mostly in the 70s. Uh, we were in this, you know, the new radical globalist phase. Mm -hmm. 
where the region was devalued, neighborhood was devalued. And, you know, you said, you know, Southeast Asia, we said, look, we turned our back on them. Gulf, you know, while well, Gulf was ready to come to you in the 70s because they just gained the independence. In fact, India was printing the Gulf rupee uh, as late as uh, 1971. So, you, the, the, that's again was a legacy of the Raj that you are protector of a lot of these kingdoms. But then we voluntarily withdrew from those roles. And you said, we, we go to the globe global level, non-aligned movement, we're going to change the world, we're going to bring new economic order, new international information order, what, are, what all you, you claimed at the global level, while you're neglecting your own neighborhood, your own region. And your economy, the more it turned inward, a lot less you had to offer. Because if you say, look, trade is bad, if that was your line in the 70s, then you know, with your own neighborhood, I mean, the infrastructure, connectivity, those were not your primary goals, standing up to the West. Uh, you know, changing, you know, the international system rather than how do I strengthen my economic ties with my neighbors. So, so at the economic level, uh, you really didn't go do very much. On the security level, uh, your focus of the old treaties that India signed, uh, because of the option that came vis-a-vis -vis China, most of the countries began to hedge against uh, Indian political dominance because your economic dominance was slipping, but India's attempt at dictating you know, who will mm -hmm. run the government in one particular country. I mean, so that I think led to uh, resentments against India built up in the 70s. So it's really, we had a, the if you go back to the beginning of the 90s when economic globalization, all of us adopted economic globalization. Till then, there was no interest in regional integration. Uh, then there was no interest in connectivity. There was no interest in trade packs. There was no interest in regional trading arrangements. While Southeast Asia was doing it, but others were doing it. We were not interested in that. It's really till the 90s, you were in a drift that actually, uh, uh, you know, slowly, certainly uh, undermined uh, India's natural geographic advantages in, in South Asia. In other words, you are saying that um, India did not have for a very long time a cold, hard, strategic vision for the South Asian region. And that is really costing us today. Exactly. I mean, I think so. So if you see, uh, as I said, look, till the 80s, uh, till the, you know, till you began the uh, SARC was initially seen as suspicion. It's only in the early 90s we begin to support the idea of, a, you know, initially, what is it, a preferential trade agreement. Let's do some connectivity. Let's exchange programs. But till then, it was all, we are sovereign. Okay, we're willing to cooperate in general terms, but there was no attempt at building an economic foundation. Second, we thought we can dictate terms to the smaller neighbors. So you created resentments and we intervened frequently. I mean, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, uh, but that created problems of its own. And externally, uh, the, the options grew from the 90s for our neighbors. Mm -hmm. While China was a purely a political card, a military card for Pakistan, a political card for most of our neighbors, now became an economic actor by the 2000s. So it's only in the last 15 years that, that India is now thinking about the region differently. And it has more resources today than ever before. As a, as a $2.6 trillion economy, India is in a position to give a lot more aid. And as you've seen in the last few years under Manmohan Singh and then under Modi, our aid levels to Afghanistan have grown, our aid levels to Bangladesh have grown. We're doing a lot more things uh, in a lot of places. So India today has got more money, more resources, more wealth. But the others have options today. Well, 30 years ago, they didn't have, to have too many options. Uh, and we prevented the World Bank and uh, others from helping, you know, regional integration because we were opposed to the multi, what is it called? The, all these were seen as imperialist tools. Uh, though we took money from the World Bank, when ADB came to us in the 80s and said, look, can we help you with regional connectivity? We said, no, 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 we don't do this. We don't need you to talk to Nepal. We do deal with them directly. Well, China actually used the FI, what do you call them, financial, international financial institutions to actually connect up with Mekong, with its neighbors. So I think we were in this perverse uh, historic mode where we were not interested in regional integration. Uh, by the time you got interested, uh, others have a lot more options and, and, and your ability to do things. There's a competition 
of a fairly vigorous one today. And to that, some people add what they call India's crude diplomatic behavior in the neighborhood. Uh, they say that India is very insensitive towards them. In fact, you yourself uh, um, wrote at some point of time, Nehru was one man in the United States and an entirely different man in the subcontinent. So there was a certain immediate... Right, nations, yeah. So, so you talked to... Nations yeah, and yeah. another man in the subcontinent. So when you stood up in the you know, United Nations, you talked about sovereign equality, all nations are equal, we got to work together for democratization of the international right. system. But within the subcontinent, you said, no, no, nobody else can intervene here. Uh, this is my, it, but that's a classic thing. The Russians do it in the near abroad, the Americans do it in the Monroe Doctrine. All great powers do it, but, but we had this uh, hypocrisy, if you will, but that hypocrisy is fairly common in international affairs, so that's not a crime. But you were not understanding, I think your region, while you claim primacy, while you demand that nobody else should come, then you should be doing a lot more. So that's why we missed out, I think, when you claimed primacy, but you could not really modernize that, what the British left for you uh, in the last many decades. Let's fast forward to the contemporary time. Should India proactively shape the political outcomes in, in, the, in the regional capitals, be it Maldives, be it Sri Lanka, be it Nepal, or is it none of our business? What's your take on that? Look, I think absolute non-intervention is not possible. That, uh, you know, it's not that uh, you don't intervene at all. Because after all, you remember the Maldives crisis uh, three months ago, uh, one party was saying India should come and intervene militarily to throw out the, the president who was become a dictator. Right. So, I mean, the opposition to Yamin was saying India must come, the only way we can be saved is if India intervenes. Now, similarly, in Nepal, in it, every time there is a crisis, a lot of people want India to intervene. And, but the moment you intervene on one side, the other, guy, other side will say, look at India, hegemonic power. One way or the other, they are going to draw you in. Right. Because your stakes are high, at some point you'll get, you will intervene. So we have to find a golden mean between absolute non-intervention to intervention, uh, knee-jerk interventions. So it's a question of judgment. It's not a question of a philosophical principle. When do you intervene? How do you intervene? And how do you ensure, I mean, you have to, that you do least harm. That is, problem with India of that size is you put your finger, you become the game. Let's take the example of Maldives. Three months ago, the crisis was unfolding, and as you correctly pointed out, some people said that India should Maldives, intervene. Maldives, no, forget the Indians. It's Maldives. Indeed. Fa yeah. Indeed. And, and some others said India should not. Indian government did not take, um, did, did not decide to intervene. If you were to be advising the government at that point of time, what would you have advised the government to do? Look, you know, in retrospect, I mean, you would see that seemed to have worked very well. But at that point of time? Yeah. But at that point, I mean, I, I think they were at one, you know, I would have said, look, you, you had had to coax you, I mean, bring them together, say that, look, which, which is what we were giving general statements. Yeah. So, uh, I would say, look, there are times when you have to intervene. Uh, in that case, uh, probably uh, patients turned out to be better than, but there are times when, you know, the clock is not going to yeah. stay still. What, what, what do you mean by intervention? What kind of intervention are we doing? No, that's what, there are political interventions, there is uh, economic intervention, sometimes you did military interventions of the kind we did in Sri Lanka, which today, in retrospect, you say, look, uh, it turned out to be very costly for us in, uh, in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Because there, again, it comes to the question of, look, democratic values, federalism. In Sri Lanka, the question was, minority rights and, and federalism, while you went in with the good intention of preserving Sri Lankan integrity against LTT separatism, while at the same time protecting the rights of the Tamil minority within a united Sri Lankan framework. But then you got shot from both sides once you went in. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, we've learned something, I think, in India from that. I mean, that you can't use force to solve these problems. You'll have to find uh, diplomatic ways. Sometimes you can't. You just can't. Uh, solve everybody's problems. Even God can't do it. Uh, the Americans can't. So, uh, why should we try and fix everybody's problems? So, but but then you have your domestic politics. If you remember, Manmohan Singh did not go to Sri Lanka uh, because of the Tamil Nadu politics. Well, Modi has been there twice. Uh, he's uh, engaged all sides. So, so I think uh, we shouldn't get let your domestic politics. You've uh, written about it that you can't let every faction in the country decide what our foreign policy is. Uh, Tamils can't dictate uh, or, you know, when we were negotiating the boundary agreement with, uh, with Bangladesh, large number of party units uh, of BJP uh, in Assam and uh, Bengal said we shouldn't sign this agreement. But then the Modi government support, you know, yeah. an agreement that was negotiated by Manmohan Singh 
uh, but could not complete it because they did not have the political will to push. And these guys have done it. So, so I think it's important how to balance that. You know, national interest is primary, and within that, but you have to make sure the state level, provincial level interest. But but you can't cede veto uh, to those people. But, but but given the lessons that we have learned from history, would you agree that it's probably not a good idea to good idea to militarily intervene? Political persuasion is probably the best way to go. Exactly. I mean, I, I would say, I mean, that's always the priority. But but then uh, there are some cases where you might have to actually intervene militarily. So it's not by ruling. Rule that out. You shouldn't. I mean, as a diplomat, you know, it's convenient not to rule it out. It's always there. Uh, but true. but but again, I think like uh, the uh, it is a question of when to when to use that brahmastra rather than, and it can't be done every day. I mean. I'm, I'm sort of trying to look at the emergence of China um, in, in the region and uh, a recent World Bank report, a glass half full, said that India's potential trade in goods with South Asia is at 62 billion against its actual trade of 19 billion. Whereas China increased its import from South Asia uh, by 30% in 2017 and its trade volume with South Asia grew from 91 billion in 2013. To 126 billion in 2017. Um, so you're looking at um, such difference in the material and economic capabilities of these two countries. So you really can't blame the South Asian countries um, um, when they when they try to go to China. Because the trade numbers you cited, I mean, the total trade volume, most of it is with India actually, because uh, India imports so much from China. Uh, right. So it is. So, so it is more than. But the fact is, you know, years. look. I think here is a fact. I mean, China is the number two economy in the world at twelve trillion dollars. We are engaging. India is engaging with the Chinese. So you can't tell your neighbors not to engage with China. So, so the problem is, China is there, and dealing with China is now important for most countries in the world, and China is the number one trading partner for so many countries. But it is still a, a tragedy that India, which has the largest, you know, boundaries with our neighbors, that you're not able to trade. Uh, that your trade volumes have remained stagnant. Things have improved certainly in the last 15 years, but but it's still a lot low. So that's where I think the question of you know one was the legacy problem that we discussed it that India's inward orientation actually sundered the traditional connectivities as the road infrastructure. The because of all of us were proving to be sovereign entities, proving our sovereignty, we cut, cut our links with our neighbors. I, mean, I think today restoring that, that uh, we barely begun that effort of building good roads across the Nepal, uh, or building, you know, opening up the waterways with Bangladesh. So all that and everyone was trying to block rather than open up. It's only in the last few years that India has at, at least has begun to take some unilateral steps. But there's a lot, lot, lot more for India to do of opening its market to its neighbors and Pakistan is in a different case but at least with the others we need to open up a lot more we need to reduce the non-tariff barriers if you ask all our neighbors they say look India has formally reduced most of the trade barriers but there's still a lot of uh, tariff, yeah, yeah. and then you have the that we are not the only ones at fault because everyone became socialist I mean, Sri Lanka for example is deeply opposed to uh, any FTAs they sign with anybody I mean with India when we're trying to negotiate a new trade agreement with them, but the middle class groups like the doctors groups, they say, no, no, you can't let the Indians come in. Uh, so the culture of inward orientation has become so deep that you are not willing to do even in your own enlightened self-interest. Pakistan, for example, it made every sense for Pakistan to import power from India or import diesel from India. And in 2012, 13, uh, Manmohan Singh government was in deep negotiations with Pakistan, with Zardari government on uh, MFN, uh, cross-border power trade, cross-border petroleum trade. On uh, last minute, the Pakistanis would back off, saying that, look, no, no, we can't take it from India. Saying that a BJP... Uh, no, yeah, whatever it is. But the fact is that they, they didn't do anything with the new government either. So, so I think everyone, the culture has been to deny yourself of trading with the neighbours. And only difference, of course, is Bangladesh, sorry, uh, Bhutan and Nepal have, have opened borders with us, but there we've not done enough in terms of the modernizing the trade relationships. With Bangladesh and India, last 10 years we've seen significant growth, uh, but there's a lot more to be done. So I would say, or the World Bank, everyone is saying, look, improve connectivity, reduce non-tariff barriers, do more trade facilitation. Uh, these are commonsensical steps, but while in the last 10 years, while we talked the talk, uh, it's pretty hard still for the Indian system to fully 
walk the walk. The thinking has to um, um, somehow change in, in Delhi. You know, uh, Dr. Rajamoni, you wrote in the Indian Express recently that India may oppose the BRI. Some in Pakistan might be having second thoughts, but China's rise has begun to in irrevocably alter the economic geography of the subcontinent. Whether Delhi likes it or not, a second sun, much brighter than India, has risen in the skies of the subcontinent. Are you saying that India should accept the Chinese incoming Chinese dominance of the region as a fait accompli? As a realist, you first you have to recognize the reality, right? right. So you can keep saying, look, China, as I said, look, China is a number two economy, $12 trillion, about to overtake the Americans and the aggregate GDP. Uh, so Chinese are going to be around. Now, you can't open the Punjab border with the Pakistanis, but the Chinese have built a road across the great Karakurams. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the China-Pakistan economic corridor is going to bring Chinese goods. I mean, we can contest on the efficiency, all that stuff. But the fact is, if China's trade with Pakistan is going to grow at much larger terms, and India-China border, India-Pakistan border remains militarized and can't even do small things, MFN trade, uh, then I think, it, so the logic is already, you see that. I mean, if the CPEC is going to bring in $50 billion of investment into Pakistan, so I can understand why the Chinese are doing Chinese are sucking in Pakistan into their economic orbit and they're doing it to all their uh, neighboring countries. So now, are you open enough? Can you make yourself more attractive? Look, for example, Nepal. I mean, uh, today, we're finally doing those railway lines into Tarai, I mean, on the other side. Why were they allowed to rot all these years? Yeah that the Chinese brought railway across the great frost of uh, Tibet into the closer to the Nepal border. It's only then you, we wake up. So we don't even have infrastructure in, infrastructure in, the, in, the, in the... No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. No, they just, at least now, they're building a railway line. The railway line existed thanks to the British. Uh, and you've not been able to build on them. It's only now we are talking about it. So first thing is, look, we can't compete with the Chinese in that sense. Uh, Chinese are going to be around. So what for us is how do I make it easier for my neighbors to work with me in building transport infrastructure? Uh, for example, power trade, you know, initially we said, look, we'll help Bangladesh, Nepal and Bhutan to trade. They had to come across a little sliver. But then suddenly the government issues the guidelines which are completely hostile to any now, we're again changing. So, while the Prime Ministers, Manmohan Singh, Modi, have talked about regional integration, we'll make it easier for our neighbours, neighbourhood first, the bureaucracy, the economic bureaucracy is still way behind. The instinct is to deny your neighbours rather than uh, thinking strategically about the neighbourhood. The Foreign Office can do the thinking, uh, but how do you get it across to the rest of the uh, economic uh, bureaucracy to, uh, to, to think about those? What does China in South Asia mean for India? I mean, there's this famous Chinese saying that one mountain cannot have two tigers. I mean, is that going to be the case? No, or? I think the, the Chinese will be a major power, like in the world. I mean, they're going to be in South Asia. But two, three things are happening. I, mean, I think one, for the first time after 40 years, US and China are beginning to get into a, a serious confrontation. Uh, we're just at the beginning of that great fight and I think uh, 2018 uh, clearly I think has marked a shift. Uh, so we're going to see a lot of that. So we'll see how that plays out in South Asia. The second is uh, the Chinese economic project, the BRI for example, has run into problems in many places. Today you talk to anyone in the world about problems with the BRI, everyone talks about Hamban Right. So they, they're all saying that look, uh, Hamban Tota is the classic example of the problems with the BRI. So there is that resistance. Three, the Chinese have also found quite stumbled in terms of understanding the politics of South Asia. For example, I mean, we had, you know, when uh, Sirisena, the president of Sri Lanka, swore in uh, Rajapaksha as the, as the new prime minister, the Chinese ambassador was the first one to show up. Uh, no, nobody else did. And in the end, uh, we see that uh, they, that couldn't be sustained. So I think, and similarly in, uh, in Maldives too, I mean, I think the assumption that you can take the political system for granted, uh, you do things without even informing uh, the, the country's government. And suddenly when the governments change, uh, they have a problem today. And now you have the Maldives president coming to India and asking for Indian help. Uh, that doesn't mean this won't change again. But, but the fact is, the Chinese are not invulnerable or uh, somehow 
10 feet tall and they'll get everything right. They don't. The problem, so I wouldn't blame the Chinese for anything they do. But the problem is for us. What is our economic policy? Why does it take for us 25 years to implement a simple thing of building a road from Burma to Mizora? So I think there is a problem of project implementation. There's a problem of market access. So if we do the right things for our own good, I mean, we don't have to compete with the Chinese. I mean, if you say, look, cross-border rail connectivity was a good thing with Nepal. Uh, we should have long ago thought about you know, taking the railway line to Kathmandu, because given the traffic that exists between the Kathmandu and northern India, but we didn't. Uh, but now uh, I think we're beginning to do it. So for us, the important thing is to provide alternatives, better regional economic policy, collaborate with the Japanese and the Americans where you can. Uh, so you can provide alternative because it's not enough to say BRI is bad. You have to provide an alternative. But, but look at it this way. Uh, notwithstanding the sustainability issues we have in BRI in the, in the neighborhood or elsewhere, the fact is that the more Chinese are engaged in infrastructure building in the, in the region, in the South Asian region, it's good for us in, in a very uh, indirect way because as and when India wants to do trade with these countries, these infrastructure, infrastructure can be used for our own trade as well. It's not going to be exclusively for the Chinese. Yeah, so, so I think it's not, a, you know, I think uh, the issue is really this. I mean, what are the terms? Yeah. So the problem is not that, look, any road, I mean, goes two ways. I mean, so it's not that uh, it can't be used. I mean, I think the government of India has raised the sovereignty argument in Kashmir. But there are other issues as well. I mean, that, that the terms of engagement, are the Chinese prepared to discuss with us? They're saying, look, we're doing this BCM, you come and do, you know, just join us, endorse it. They're not saying we want to negotiate the terms. So I think the Chinese are smarter than most of us think. So they're going to adapt. When the pressure of pushback, it's happened in Sri Lanka, it's happened in Maldives, it's happened in Malaysia, it's happened in a lot of countries where people feel the terms were not good. So, if, so you think CPEC or BRI, notwithstanding the sovereignty issues, if the Chinese are willing to negotiate with India, India should be open to negotiating yeah, at with least, them? Yeah, at least, I mean, we should be uh, able to negotiate with them. I mean, if they come with a specific proposal, let's do this, who gets <coughs> what, who, which companies get to do what. Uh, right now, it's really a, a national project demanding international support. You wrote about SARC something very interesting recently. You said that India has no reason to shed tears for the SARC. It is no longer the only game in town. In fact, it was never much of a game. How we imagine and construct regions change according to circumstances. So is, this, is the change in South Asia, is it to our advantage or to our disadvantage? And are you, are you saying that the one... I mean, I may be overstating my point when I say SARC has been an India-centric institution uh, because of Pakistan's pressure, etc., etc. But still, it was to some extent an India-centric institution. So the the pa the passing of SARC, uh, passing away of SARC, you think that's that's not necessarily a bad thing? No, I think it's look finally as again as a realist, as a, as an instrumentalist, if you will. I mean, I would say, look, what has SARC done lately? That yeah, no, no. I mean, the problem was like. Uh, just give you one example. Yeah. I mean, the, in the run-up to the 2014 SARC summit in Kathmandu, uh, all the seven, you know, eight countries negotiated a, you know, a cross-border, you know, movement of, uh, motor you know, vehicles. Yeah, motor vehicles agreement. Now, the Pakistanis had signed off. Pakistani officials signed off on it. It was negotiated with them in the room, mm -hmm. so it was not as if it was. So finally, when you have actually the the principles, that is, the the prime ministers come to Kathmandu, Pakistan pulls back. So, sorry, we can't sign it. So now, what is the point of having Pakistan, <coughs> which negotiates at the official level but pulls back because of whatever pressures that they have? <coughs> so, the, so I'm not blaming Pakistan. I'm saying Pakistan doesn't want to be economic integration of SARC. It only wants it as a forum to discuss political issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what what does it make a difference? In any case, Pakistan is not letting anything happen. So, uh, how does it matter? In any case, it's Pakistan's right. So my view is that, look, that it should be whoever wants to do it, let's do it. Okay. So that's why you saw after 2014, we focused on the BIMSTEC and we begin to do uh, some things within the, in the eastern half. We, then we tried to do uh, BBIN, that is within the region. Then we tried to do uh, with BIMSTEC across the region. So I think it's more geographic, speaking more geographically. India has borders with all countries except Afghanistan. If India opens its markets, you don't need SARC. If you're talking about economic integration, if India connects with its neighbors, if you do it with everyone, then it doesn't matter what Pakistan does. You do it with the rest. You don't need to go to SARC to do connectivity. 
so, so I would say it is what you do unilaterally. Given your size, you can make a big difference. You can do things bilaterally. Sometimes for people it's more convenient to have a trilateral forum. So, but the key is we must change our policies rather than saying the forum, the mechanism is, is more important. It, what is more important is what's your national policy? Is it promoting regional integration? Bilaterally, plurilaterally, multilaterally, trilaterally. That is more important than, oh, there is this forum. It must meet every year. Say the same silly things. I mean, uh, which is where this song has been. Here is my last question. You often made the argument that there is a convergence of interests, American and Indian interests in South Asia. Is it possible to have a convergence of the American, Indian, and Chinese interests in the region, or is that stretching it? No, I, I think there was a time when actually, if you remember, even the last few years, the Americans were saying, look, uh, we must bring China into Afghanistan. The Chinese can put pressure on Pakistan to yes. change course. Uh, it's not really succeeded. That the Americans had no, for, since 1971, the Americans and the Chinese were partners. So we had a problem with both of them. Right. They didn't have a problem with each other. Yeah. After all, it's America that brought China into the global trading system, made them legitimate, the whole of the world engaged with them. But today they're fighting. Yeah. So. China and US are not going to be on the same page, increasingly difficult I see in the days ahead. So for us, it's not a question of, uh, uh, you know, whether they have good relationship or not. I mean, that's a, that is a, a fundamental condition that we have to deal with. For us, the more important is who can help me integrate my region? That is your, but if China is going to establish military bases, what is their argument with the Americans? The Americans might establish a military base in Pakistan. The Americans will do things with Pakistan. That everything you complained about America, actually China has done. Now tomorrow China comes into Sri Lanka, Maldives, wherever it is. That is your problem. So how much we pretend, I, I'm saying the word pretend, to be friends. Uh, the Chinese power is running into your proclaimed vision for the region. So that problem is not going to run away. How much you work with Americans is a secondary thing. That, that, that your capacity is being constrained. Now, if someday you have a boundary agreement with the Chinese, maybe you can cooperate. But right now, uh, you have not got solutions from the Chinese for the boundary problem. You haven't got anything on the uh, uh, trade deficit issue. And as a great power, they see it is their right to have security relationships with South Asian countries, which doesn't suit you. It is so also the, their so, neighborhood. So, yeah, so I would think you will end up doing more with Japan uh, and the Americans and the Europeans uh, in in uh, in South Asia to balance the uh, balance the Chinese rather than everybody's not going to uh, those days are gone. I mean, there was a, maybe there was a moment in the 90s, uh, but today that moment is not there. Dr. Rajamohan, wonderful talking to you. Thanks, yeah. To receive instant updates on all videos from the Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.